Greetings. Welcome to Introduction to SQL for Excel Users, Part 8, More Groups. I am your instructor, Dave Lang. So I have open the Excel file corresponding to Part 8 of the tutorial. You can see it right here, SQL for Excel Users, Part 8. And what we see here is our handy dandy call center table with 120 rows of beautiful call center data for AdventureWorks. When we talk about groups, grouping is awesome. As we saw in the previous tutorial, grouping is extremely useful. And more importantly, running calculations specifically on groups, sums, averages, min, count, max, that sort of thing, wildly useful and something that you do all the time when you're analyzing data. Now, what's really cool is this idea that sometimes you need multi-level grouping or groups of groups, or groups of groups of groups, and so on and so forth. So this is very easy to do in Excel. So for example, I just take my handy dandy call center table here, and I just insert a pivot table. And I say, okay, cool, just stick it in the sheet, I won't even worry about naming it. One way I could do this, if I wanted to analyze things, I could say, look, I'm interested in, first and foremost, understanding what's going on in the data based on grouping by shift. And I just drag shift down in the rows and lo and behold, I have my groups, just like we saw in the last video. But I can go even more than that. And I can say, look, you know, how does the data work vis-a-vis -vis not only shift, but also wage types at the same time? Excel handles this no problem. We just drag and drop wage down here. And here we go, we have groups within groups. Notice that there are only two wage types in the data, holiday and weekday. But Excel is smart enough to say, okay, look, within each shift, there are also these two wage groups. So you have holiday and weekday, holiday, and weekday, holiday, and weekday, holiday and weekday. And this is awesome because this allows us to do cool things. Like for example, maybe I wanna know something about the level one operators in terms of shifts and wage types. So I just drag and drop and automatically Excel says, hey, level one operators appears to be a numeric column. So I'll just sum it by default. And lo and behold, I can see here the sums of level one operators as it varies by wage type and shift simultaneously. And I can do even more. I can say, well, you know what? What was the minimum number here? So I can grab the min. And I can say, what is the max? And I can go do that real quick and max. And there you go, and it's awesome, right? This is awesome. Groups within groups is very, very useful stuff. Now here's the thing. Excel actually will allow you to put more and more groupings in, right? So for example, you could put in, oh, let's see, what's another one we could put in here? Um, Let's go check out the data real quick and see if we got another categorical that we can use. Uh, well, we don't really have another categorical, but let's just go ahead and manufacture one. Let's put the date key in there. Okay, so now we're three levels deep. So Excel will allow you to group within groups to a very large degree. You can have multiple groups nested, nested within each other. Problem becomes though, from a human brain perspective, we can only handle so many groups at once. And one way to think about this is dimensions. This grouping is one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions. You know, if you add more and more groups, you get more and more dimensions. That's one way to think about it. And as you might imagine, the human brain, once we get to super high dimensional space, we just don't really handle things too well. So just know that you can group a lot. However, in practice, how useful it's for, it is for you from an analytical perspective is really going to depend on the situation. Now, not surprisingly, we do all of these kinds of things in, it, in SQL as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and flip over to SQL Server Management Studio, and we'll see some grouping within groups, or groups within groups, excuse me, in SQL. All righty then. Here I am in SQL Server Management Studio. I'm connected to database here, and you can see I have some SQL that mimics the first Excel pivot table. Now, conceptually, what we saw in Excel was if we want to add more groups, we just put more and more features, more and more variables, more and more columns into the rows area of the Excel pivot table user interface. That allowed me to start with shift 
and then I added wedge type, and now I had two levels of groupings, and the Excel pivot table was more than happy to create the pivot table for me and also do the calculations appropriately. Similarly, in Excel, you just add more columns in your group by. You drag more columns to the rows in the Excel pivot table, and you just add more columns to the group by and the SQL, and what you get is exactly the same thing. So this query right here will simulate our pivot table that we had in Excel. And you can see here, no problem, except for one little detail. Notice that the groupings are not listed in the same order as they were in Excel. And this is critical, and I talked about this before in the previous video. SQL does not give you any assurances, generally speaking, regarding to sort order. Sometimes the data is sorted by happenstance, just the way you like it, but in general, you shouldn't count on it. SQL is, does, gives you no guarantees. So if you want your data to be ordered, if you want it to be sorted, and when you do analytics, oftentimes you do care about sort order. You want the query to pull back the data in a particular order, in a particular format. If you want that, you need to be explicit. So I can just scroll down here and here's an improved query. Notice that we've just done the order by here. Now if I run this, boom. You can see here how the data is now sorted exactly the way we wanted to. It mimics what we saw in SQL. Now, once again, as I demonstrated before in Excel, if we wanted to get kooky, we could say, look, you know what, let's go ahead and add another another grouping within the grouping. So we can do this with FCC dot, and we did date key last time. And we'll go ahead and sort also by the date key as well. And if I run this, SQL is more than happy to, oh wait, well, hold on, let me add the uh, date column here. That would help. There you go. And then you get the results that you saw before in Excel, right? So just like Excel, you can add more and more subgroupings in SQL. SQL is more than happy. You can add, I don't even know what the limit is, but I've never ran into it in practice in more than 20 years of working with SQL. So that tells you something about, you can group infinitely deep, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be useful for you. But it's pretty simple. Just as you do in Excel, just add more and more columns to the group by, and notice that the order matters. So I'm back in Excel, and what I wanna talk a little bit more is about the summarization functions that Excel gives you out of the box. And I mentioned this briefly last video, but it bears repeating because it's extremely important. So I can pull up the summarization functions that you get out of the box with Excel, and you get a number of them sum, an average, and count, a min, max, variance, standard deviation, that sort of thing. These are akin to, as I mentioned in the last video, the last tutorial, these are akin to what is known in SQL as aggregate functions. They are specifically functions that are used to work over groups of data. Now, this is super important. These functions here in the pivot table are group aware, quote unquote, group aware which means that they are smart. They understand, for example, in this pivot table, that when I do the sum, it needs to be applied only to the values that correspond to 2014-0503 of the holiday wage type of the AM shift, right? And this was the date key. Now, it turns out that these are just individual values, so it's kind of silly because you'll notice here, the min and the max are all the same as the actual sum because these are individual rows. So it's kind of silly. Actually, let's me just, let me just go ahead and remove it. Okay, that's better. Notice that the sum and the min and the max are group aware. And not only that, they're group within group aware. And they're group within group within group aware as well. This is super important, right? This allows you to do very, very cool things. As you slice and dice your data to finer and finer grain, with the summarization functions in Excel pivot tables, they're smart. They know what you're doing and they say, look, I'm not going to calculate with extraneous data. I'm going to only calculate on the data that you are interested in. Now, once again, given the pattern of this tutorial, not surprisingly, SQL aggregate functions work exactly the same way. They are also group aware. So let's go ahead and 
flip back over to SSMS and take a look at the most commonly used aggregate functions in practice. Back in SSMS here, and you can see here, here's a query that uses the five most commonly used SQL aggregate functions in practice. Now, of course, this is based on my work. So maybe another person who's been using SQL for a long time might disagree and say, hey, Dave, no, you actually use this function a lot. However, in my work, in more than 20 years of working with SQL, these are the five main aggregate functions that I use more often than anything else. And they are count, right, which counts the number of records in a particular group or subgroup or group of group of groups, the sum, which adds everything up, the minimum value, the maximum value, and the average value. These tend to be the most useful functions in practice. Now I'll go ahead and run this and you can see all of the goodness that comes out here. Now you can see I, I've only using, I'm only using one group level. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the previous section with Excel, aggregate functions are smart. They are group aware in SQL and they will do group of groups. So for example, I can easily add FCC wage type here and run that. And you can see here, oh well, once again, I need to add the column. And you can see here that I've added the wage type column. And once again, everything is group aware. You can see here the average changes, the max changes, the min level changes, all these sorts of things happen. Now notice that over here, the average level one column, that seems kind of weird, right? That the, that the average seems to be just a whole number. Now what we know is from previous videos is this might be an integer arithmetic problem. So one way to check that real quick, and you should always, when you're using aggregate functions, always be aware of this, right? Min and max are always going to work just fine. Sum is always going to work just fine. And count's always going to work just fine if you're working with individual integer values, because all of those produce integer results. Average, however, does not. So you can do this. So we're just going to cast this as a decimal. And I'll just pick, I don't know, four, two. If you remember from our previous videos, this says, give me four total digits and give me two to the right of the decimal point. So what I'm doing here is I'm casting level one operators first as a decimal and then giving the average. That should flip me over from integer arithmetic to floating point or decimal point arithmetic, and I should get a different result. And you can see here, sure enough, notice that I've lost information, but by, by doing this, I have gained it back. Remember that when you're working with aggregate functions in SQL, you need to make sure that you're being cognizant of the data types that you're using, right? Are you in integer arithmetic land or are you in floating point arithmetic land? And does that matter? And once again, let's go ahead and take a look at the complete list of T-SQL aggregate functions. So I'll go ahead and just quickly Google T-SQL aggregate functions, hit enter. Right up at the top here, we've got Microsoft's documentation for T-SQL. And you can see here all of the different aggregate functions that are available for you. You got a bunch. Just as you have more in Excel, you have more summarization functions in Excel than you typically use most of the time. Same with the aggregate functions, but they're there in case you need them for various things like, for example, uh, standard deviation, standard deviation of the population. And if you don't know what those mean, don't worry about it. They're statistical calculations, but they're there if you need them. There you have it. That's the video for today. More about groups. Next up in video nine, we're going to be start talking about another way that you can create logical groups in SQL which are known as windows, and those are extremely powerful. So it's gonna continue this theme that groups and groups within groups are very, very powerful ways to analyze your data, and SQL provides you lots and lots of options for these, for this particular scenario. Until next time, stay healthy, and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.